हेलो गाइस हाउ आर यू आई एम हरदीप सिंह वेलकम बैक टू योर ओन यूट्यूब चैनल आल्स अपडेट्स एंड रीसेंट एग्जाम्स फॉर मोर अपडेट्स रिलेटेड टू रीसेंट आल्स एग्जाम राइटिंग दस टॉपिक्स लिस्टिंग रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट एंड स्पीकिंग क्यू कट गेस्ट वर्क प्लीज गाइस पार्टिसिपेट इन एवरी डे लिस्टिंग एंड रीडिंग प्रैक्टिस टेस्ट टू अचीव योर डिजायर बैंड स्कोर इन योर एक्चुअल आल्स एग्जाम Please hit the like and subscribe button. Press the bell icon for the upcoming notifications. Don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page Alts updates and recent exams. Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a cashier in a bank and a customer. The customer is asking for advice about traveler's checks. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. How can I help you? Yes, hello. I'm going away on holiday next month and I was wondering if you could give me some advice about traveler's checks. Yes, of course. Where are you off to? Anywhere nice? To France, to Paris for a week. Oh, lovely. So how many checks would you like to order? Well, before I do, are they the best option, traveler's checks? Well, they're certainly safer than taking cash. If they get lost or stolen, they can be replaced, usually within 24 hours. It's a good idea to have a small amount of cash though for snacks and taxis, that sort of thing. Yes, that's what I was thinking. What about my credit card? Are there any charges for using it abroad? No, it's debit cards that get charged for ATM withdrawals, not credit cards. And remember, anything you buy with a card might be covered by insurance. So if something you buy turns out to be faulty or Before you hear more of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. So it's probably a good idea to do all three then. Traveler's checks, credit card, some cash. Yes? Yes. So how many traveler's checks would you like? I was thinking about 300 pounds. How long will they take to arrive? It depends. If you order before half past 2 between Monday and Thursday, you'll have them the next day by 10 a.m. in the branch. or if we post them to you you'll have them by 5 pm oh but i was hoping i could order them today that's okay orders taken any time on saturday will be here in the branch at 10 am on tuesday or delivered to your home by tuesday at 1:30 okay that's all right i don't mind waiting until then can i order them now yes have you got an account with us yes here's my credit card thanks let's just log in and i can place an order for you Could you confirm your date of birth? 15th of the 3rd, 1975. What's the commission on the checks, by the way? It's 1.5%. That's pretty standard, I think you'll find. And what happens if I don't spend them all? Will I be able to bring them back? Yes, no problem. We buy them back and there are no additional charges or conditions of return. So, would you like me to go ahead and place an order? Yes, yes please. Would you be coming in to collect them? I don't think I'll have the chance to come into the branch on Tuesday. Could you send them to my house? No problem. Can I just check your address? 54 Tavistock Road? Yes, that's right. Postcode CB13LR? That's it, yes. Okay. So that's 300 pounds worth of traveler's checks. Yes, please. Now, what about euros? Would you like to order any? No, no thank you. I still have some at home from the last holiday. I forgot to change them at the airport when we got back. I was going to give them to our daughter, but I'll treat myself for a change, I think. Good idea. So, 300 pounds in traveler's checks. Could I ask you to sign here to confirm the order? Thank you. Okay.
That's done for you. Your cheques will be with you by 1.30 Tuesday. Someone will need to be at home to sign for them. Will that be OK? Yes. I'll be at work, but my husband will be in. Is that OK? Yes, that's fine. Have a lovely holiday. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. You are going to hear an interview with a student advisor on a podcast. The advisor is giving financial advice for overseas students going to the UK to study at university. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to our monthly podcast for overseas students planning to study in the UK. This month we're looking at how to make your money last longer while studying here. And to help us find some bargains, I have Jenny Lubeck from the Student Union. Jenny, students are renowned for being hard up, but there are lots of savings to be made, aren't there? Well, as soon as students start their course at university or college, they'll be able to buy their NUS Extra card. This will enable them to get a wide range of discounts on essentials like books, clothes and eating out. The card only costs about £12 for one year, and for about the same amount you can include an ISAAC card. The ISAAC is an internationally recognised discount card for full-time students. Discount offerings vary and usually include things like travel, guidebooks, music, eating out, that kind of thing. Students are told all about this when they start their studies, but if your listeners want to find out more about these cards before they arrive, I've put some details of websites on the podcast page. Now, travel costs can mount up for students, can't they? I know the Isaac card is useful here, but are there any other things students should be aware of? Understandably, lots of overseas students like to take the opportunity to travel around the country whilst they're in the UK. And, for this reason, I'd strongly recommend they invest in a young person's real card. To be eligible, you need to be between 16 and 25. Mature students over the age of 25 can also apply, so long as they're in full-time education. You can buy a one-year or three-year card and it gives you a third off rail journeys across the UK. The card also gives you access to competitions and things like theatre discounts and holiday offers. At the moment, a one-year card costs £28 and it's £65 for a three-year card. Before you hear more of the interview, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. And what about buses? Um, well, as well as the rail card, it's also more than likely the local bus operators will offer discounted bus travel with their own travel cards. These aren't aimed specifically at students, but can still save you a lot of money if you use the buses regularly. You can usually get these cards for a week, a month, a term, or a whole year, 
with bigger savings the longer the period. Another advantage of these cards is that, as well as making it cheaper to commute to and from university, you'll also find them very handy free transport whenever you need to do some shopping or visit friends in your area. Are there any cultural things that students coming to the UK might not be aware of that can save them money? Some overseas students are surprised by the amount of recycling that goes on in the UK and how much money can be saved in the process. There'll be a roaring trade in used course books in the student union on campus. Lots of students who were on the same course as you the year before will be selling their books at the end of their course. They'll be a lot cheaper than buying them new. Off campus, you'll find lots of charity shops in your local town centre with a good selection of novels and you'll often get some really nice clothes, CDs and DVDs that people have donated and all at very cheap prices. Of course, shopping in this way means you're contributing to a worthwhile cause as well. And check your local paper frequently for car boot sales. Car boot sales are a very British style of market, where private individuals come together to sell home and garden goods. In fact, they're a great way of recycling some of your own unwanted stuff and can help you make some money in the process. Finally, there are websites and mailing lists where local people offer up items they no longer want for free, as long as you agree to collect them. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. You will hear Dr. Richardson discussing the requirements of a course and the writing of an essay with a student. First, you will have some time to look at questions 21 to 30. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 28. Enter, please. Good afternoon, Dr Richardson. Good afternoon. You're David Simons, is that right? Yes. I've got an appointment to talk about the course requirements with you. Fine. Now, why don't you take a seat over there and I'll just get some details from you. First, can I have your home address and your student number? That's 15 Market Avenue, Hornsby, and my student number is C97H85. OK. Now, I see here that you've already completed 18 credit points, but that you haven't done the Screen Studies course, which is normally a prerequisite for this course. Why is that, David? Oh. The course coordinator gave me an exemption because I've worked for a couple of years in the movie and television business and they considered my practical experience fulfilled the same requirements. Fine. Shall we go over the course requirements first and then you can bring up any queries or problems you might have. It might be most useful to start with a few dates. The final examination will be in the last week of June, that's the week of the 23rd. But the final date hasn't been set. It should be the 25th or the 20th, but you don't have to worry about that yet. Before that, as you can see in your study guide, there are three essay assignments and some set exercises. I'll deal with these first. These set exercises are concerned with defining concepts and key terms. They do have fixed answers, not in the wording, but in the content. To that extent, they're quite mechanical 
and provide an opportunity for you to do very well as long as your answers are very specific and clear. Yes, I see there are about 20 terms here. How long should the answers be? You shouldn't exceed 250 words for each term. Right, that looks easy enough. And the third assignment seems fairly straightforward too. Just a journalistic type review of a recent development in television. It's not so different from what I've done in my work. Yes, it should be fairly easy for you. But don't exceed 1,000 words on that one. Essays 1 and 2 are the long ones. The first essay should be about 2,000 words and the second 2,500 to 3,000. And the approach for both should be analytical. You now have another chance to look at questions. In the first one, your focus should be on TV and the audience, and you should primarily consider the theoretical issues, particularly in relation to trying to understand audience studies. In the second, I'll want you to focus on analysing television programmes. Should I concentrate on one particular type of programme for that? Not necessarily, but you must be careful not to overextend yourself here. A comparison between two programmes, or even between two channels, is fine, or a focus on one type of programme, such as a particular series, works well here. So if I wanted to look at television news programmes, that would be OK? Yes, there would be no problem with that. In fact, it's quite a popular choice, and most students handle it very well. Good. I'll probably do that because it's the area I want to work in later. Later, during the course, Dr Richardson gives David some advice and warnings about his essay. Ah, uh, come in and sit down, David. You wanted to talk to me about your second essay, is that right? Yes, Dr Richardson. I just want your comments on what I'm planning to do. I'm doing the essay on the differences between TV news programmes at different hours of the day. How many time slots are you planning to consider? Well, I think I'd look at all of them. That'd be five slots. The breakfast news, the mid-morning news and the midday news. That's three. Then there's the six o'clock news, then the ten o'clock and midnight programmes. So that's six, not five. Hmm, that's rather a lot. And you'd have a lot of different audiences to consider. Why don't you just do two, say, the mid-morning and then six o'clock? That should give you two fairly contrasting approaches with two main audience compositions. Oh, just two then? Yes, I think that'd be much better. Now, how many actual programmes do you plan to work with? I suppose you think analysing a whole week of news programmes would be too many. Well, that depends on how much of each programme, if you concentrate on one particular type of news item, say the sports news or local items, it might be all right. Yes, I can see that would be a good idea. I won't make a decision now before I collect a sample of programmes over a whole week. I'll look at them and see what items appear throughout the week. Yes, that's a sound approach. Now, we're getting close to the deadline. Can you finish it in time? Yes, I think so. I've completed the reading and I know what my basic approach is, so it's really just a matter of pulling it all together now. Fine, David. I'll look forward to reading it. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part four. You will hear an extract from a student's presentation about computer viruses. First, you will have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Well, good afternoon. Last week, we were looking at the positive effects that computers have had on our society. This week, we'll talk about one of the negatives, computer viruses. In today's session, John Upton will be sharing some of the findings of his research project. So, over to you, John. Thanks. Mr Yardley asked me to talk to you about the project I did from last term. Actually, it's really very rewarding to do this research project about computer viruses. OK, so what is a computer virus? Well, it is a software program that has been designed, tested and released by a human programmer with the single intention of corrupting and destroying useful programs. Put in simple terms, it's a way of causing lots of trouble for ordinary people just to be a nuisance. It's known as a virus because, although it's not a biological organism, it functions in a similar way, in that it seeks out a host, that is, a body in which to live, and multiply, your computer, with the end result of destroying that host. Let's go back 50 years. In 1949, in the early days of computer technology, John Van Neumann presented the first model of a computer virus program in his paper, Theory and Organization of Complicated Automata. Soon after this paper was published, we find reference to a game known as Core Wars. Core Wars was initially created for intellectual entertainment by three Americans working on large mainframe computers. Remember, in those days, computers were the size of a couple of rooms. By the 1980s, for the small sum of $2 postage, anyone could get details on how to play Core Wars, and very soon after, we see the emergence of a new pastime, one where people spent time creating programs that could escape the game and destroy other programs. In this way, the first computer viruses were born. Like their biological counterparts, computer viruses are picked up through casual habits. Virus programs are often intentionally placed within useful programs in the public domain, or they're included in software which is not official. That is, software you might have acquired on the black market, which, of course, you don't do. It seems quite hard to believe that anyone would go to this level of deceit to intentionally corrupt the data of others, but the rise in the number of computer software infections and the amount of lost data that we are seeing these days is proof that these virus programmers are going to extremes to do just that. They are going out of their way to create programs that hide inside legitimate software applications and cause all sorts of errors that the average end user will then mistake for hardware failure. In other words, they will think that the problem lies with their own computer. So, what can we do to combat these people? Well, the first thing is to realise that virus programmers succeed because people are not always careful about where they get their programmes from. So, number one, be very careful. And I don't just mean that you should be careful about the source of your software. You also need to take care with emails and avoid any messages which are suspicious looking. For instance, a message that says, I love you, or win $50. So, 
The second golden rule is avoid trouble. Now, there are other things we can do to protect ourselves. We can try to find out exactly how the viruses work, how they accomplish their aims. In other words, we need to understand them. And, of course, there is a good selection of antivirus software available on the market now, as well as on the internet, to combat the virus plague. So another way of protecting ourselves and our computers is to be well prepared. And, before I leave you, let me just say that if you ever run into one of those virus guys, tell them what you think of them. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. So guys, don't forget like, subscribe and share my YouTube channel and my Facebook page. I'll update some recent exams for more updates related to recent IELTS exam writing as topics, listening, reading, practice test and speaking, you got guesswork. Please guys participate in everyday new IELTS listening and reading practice tests to achieve your desired band score in your actual IELTS exam. For more IELTS material, visit my official website www.ielsupdatesandrecentexams.com The link is given below in the description. If you need PDF files of latest IELTS material, then please join my Telegram channel. So guys, please write your score below the comment section. Again, thanks for listening. God bless you all guys. Stay tuned. Stay safe.